So this morning we heard of various ways in which we can create life and enhance life and extend life. Uh, some of it was very much in the now, some of it was speculative and still in the future. I'd like to continue that investigation by bringing out our next speaker. He is Dr. Shav Keshavchi, um, and he deals in uh, miracles that are <coughs> practical. So apparently the first ever uh, lung transplant in the world was done right here in Toronto at the Toronto General Hospital in 1983. And Dr. Keshavchi has trained at THG, TGH, sorry, and has perfected some of those techniques, and he will now reveal some of the modern miracles which he has created. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for being here. It's uh, an honor to present at an event like this and to have your, your attention. If you think about organ transplantation, it really is a, a miracle. And um, in fact, this year is the year of the uh, celebration of the anniversary of the 50th year since the first heart transplant was done successfully. And uh, as Moses mentioned, we did the first uh, successful lung transplant in the world here at Toronto General Hospital in 1983. <laughs> And since 1983, uh, we have led the world in innovation in lung transplantation, but what I'm going to do is talk to you a little bit about how organ transplantation saves lives and, and how we're transforming the field. So um, with, with organ failure, whether it's your lung, your heart, kidneys, liver, pancreas, um, Often, many patients around the world are dying of end-stage organ disease, and transplantation is really a miracle that saves lives. And, and how we have achieved this from the very beginning was by uh, taking the organs out of uh, someone who's died and preserving them. And the cornerstone of preservation has been to keep the organ cold. And so what we do is we flush the organ with a cold solution, you cool the temperature down to about four or five degrees, and that slows down metabolism. And the whole idea is it also slows down the dying process. And so you then uh, race the clock, and you, you fly the organs over to the recipient and, and adeptly reattach the organ uh, to, the, to the dying patient and save their life. And it's, it's been a wonderful miracle that I uh, experienced as a resident at Toronto General Hospital and, and inspired me to go into the career of, of lung surgery and, and uh, transplantation. But when, when you look at what we do, um, you, you realize it's, it's, it's kind of limited. We, we can't deal with the unmet need of people dying on the wait lists. And even if you look at lungs, of, of all the lungs available for transplantation, only 15 to 20 percent of them are usable. So even if you sign your donor card and you want to be an organ donor, we can't use the lungs 80 percent of the time. And the reason is that we have to be sure that they're going to work. And if they don't work, the, the, the patient dies. So we always err on the side of safety um, and, and end up turning down more organs than we accept. So really, the idea was, can, can we do something about uh, using the organs that we have access to and make them transplantable? Taking you back to the concept of cooling the organs down, you only get a snapshot view of, of what the organ's function is like in, in the donor. You, you, we, we do x-rays, we do blood tests, we do bronchoscopy looking in the lungs, we examine them directly, and, and so on. But that's the limited information we have with today's medicine. Then when you cool it down, you shut it down, and you have no way of knowing anything more about that organ. It's static at the state you have it, and you hope that you keep it at least at that state or with minor deterioration. So what about the concept of, well, if can we heal these organs? And we've been looking at, at ways to actually uh, heal these organs in, before we transplant them, to repair them. And, and we started to look at that, at, at look at strategies 
to heal the, the organ in the, the organ donor uh, before we take the organs out. And, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about that. But we also realize that that's impractical. With all the fantastic tools, uh, you saw some of the gene editing and, and things that can be done with modern medicine. We don't have the time in the middle of the night in a small hospital to be able to do that kind of fantastic science. So what we're going to do, as I'm going to show you, is how we've changed the paradigm of transplantation. If I can have you guys come on the stage, please. So what you're going to see here is a device uh, that we uh, developed here in Toronto, and, and it's called the XOR device, outside the OR. Uh, and it's a device that we've, we've designed to fix organs. And, and when I say fix organs, is, is if you look at this machine, think of it as a mini intensive care unit for the organ. And, and what you have here is, is a support system for an organ that keeps it at normal body temperature. Now normally a lung will die within two to three minutes at normal body temperature if it's not supported or cooled. Here you have a lung which happens to be a pig lung and I, I, you'll see it on, on the screen shortly that, that was taken out of a pig and preserved and put on our, our device earlier this morning. And, and what it has is it has a, a pump that perfuses a nutritive solution through it that, that keeps the lung alive, provides nutrient, removes waste. It has a breathing machine, a ventilator, just like you have uh, for patients in the intensive care unit, and, and, a, and a responsive system that can, can cater to the needs of the lung. And what we can do as a take-home message for you is a personalized medicine approach to the management of organ donors. So when we get a, a lung that is perfect, we can transplant it. For the 80% of lungs that are not perfect, we put it on a support system. We harness the natural abilities of the body to heal, and you're going to hear many examples of that and have already heard about it this morning. But we also look at ways to facilitate healing. And we can diagnose what's wrong with the lung and treat it in a specific way. So if a lung happens to have an infection, we can treat it with high-dose antibiotics. We don't have to worry about the toxicity of the antibiotics on the organs because um, there's no ears, there's no liver, there's no kidneys to have toxicity. The lung is on its own, and we can do exactly what the lung needs. We're working on machines to work on kidneys, on hearts, and livers so that we can expand this technology. So what you see here, the lung is breathing, those connectors are, are connected to the artery that goes into the lung and the, vein, the, the, the veins that come back out of the lung and would go into the heart. And, and it's, it's, it's kept in a protective mode. So it's not being stressed, it's allowed to heal, and we facilitate healing. So the, the other concept is, is that w when we take organs from people that have died, um, they're not perfect, right? They're never going to be perfect. Somebody died, it was an, a, 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 a trauma, or it was a, a stroke, or a head injury, um, brain death, uh, being on a ventilator, being resuscitated. There's, these are all injuries that happen to the lungs. And, and as I mentioned, at best, we have lungs that are um, slightly damaged that we try and, and prevent further damage. The next problem that happens is when you transplant that lung into someone else, that lung was not programmed to be taken out of someone's body, flown across the country and put into someone else's body. It didn't know to expect that. But guess what? We can program that lung to expect that and be ready for that. And more importantly, the host's immune system is going to spend the rest of the host's life attacking that organ. It's foreign and they're going to try and get rid of it. So can we actually make the lung look more like self so that it won't be rejected? And the goal in our research lab is to make a lung that will outlive the recipient that you put it in. If you have lung disease and you need a lung transplant, you should never have to think of lung failure ever again. Right now, we, don't, we can't promise that because you'll continue to reject that lung for as long as you live until we figure out tolerance and, and so on. So what we've been doing is, is then harnessing the power of molecular medicine we take the common cold virus, the adenovirus, take the genes out of, of, out of the virus that, uh, and take the viral genes out, 
and put in anti-rejection genes and genes that look more like self, make the lung look more like self. We use IL-10, which is a cytokine that down-regulates the immune system. So basically, you can fool the recipient into thinking that this lung is self. And, and again, we can, we can access the airway with a bronchoscope, just like a patient. We can deliver the gene. We can measure the effect and know when we have the, the gene upregulation and when the lung is ready for transplantation. And this has incredible spin-off capabilities for us. One is it, 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 it may uh, make or, organ transplantation an elective procedure that you do it in the morning, and I'm hoping that will work in my lifetime, because right now we do it at 3 o'clock in the morning most of the time. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the other thing that it'll do is, is make it safer, right? I mean, everybody in, on the team is working at, at proper uh, hours for human beings uh, to, to work at their best capabilities. It'll decrease the cost of transplantation. In fact, one of the things we're looking at and, and we have done is we've built the first organ repair center in the world at Toronto General Hospital. The prototype uh, case that we did, a colleague of mine from Chicago called and said, I've got a patient who's dying and we have lungs in Wisconsin, the patient's in Chicago, and this procedure isn't uh, approved yet in the United States. Can you repair that lung in Toronto? So we flew the lung to Toronto General, repaired it, flew it to Chicago, and he successfully transplanted that patient. So after we did that, then, then we went on to say, well, how are we going to scale this to the rest of the world? And, and as much as this was a lot of fun to develop in the research lab, and I need to acknowledge our engineers and students that are standing quietly in the back, um, these are, it, it is a lot of hard work. And, and as, a, as a transplant surgeon, I realized pretty quickly that I don't really want to spend six or 10 hours fixing a lung and then have a 12-hour operation to do after it, which is the current way that, that we would be rolling this out. So, so we, we um, started to figure out how are we going to scale this. Uh, we started training organ perfusion specialists, and Man Yin Chen at the back there is the first organ perfusion specialist in the world. And, and so this, again, is a new thing. Nobody knew what an organ perfusion specialist. It's a new category of healthcare worker. We created a, a, a training program and an accreditation program and an examination so that, that Man Yin and, and his colleagues with his skills trained in Toronto here can carry out organ perfusion uh, repair of lungs at the, as a delegated act from, from a surgeon. We then went and, and uh, started uh, a, a, an organ repair company in the United States called Perfusix. Uh, this was Perfusix Canada, was a Toronto General Hospital, Perfusix USA. We started in, in Silver Spring, Maryland. It was then uh, we partnered with United Therapeutics and they went on to buy uh, Perfusix USA from us. Uh, and now we have this company called Lung Bioengineering. So we have the first organ repair hospital in Silver Silver Spring, Maryland, where, where we have six rooms where, where we have uh, the ability to do this for lungs. And we're currently in a clinical trial where the Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, University of Maryland, Michigan, Pittsburgh send their lungs to us, we repair them and send them back. So proving the concept of an organ repair center. And we're, we've partnered with the Mayo to, to build the second organ repair center in, in uh, Jacksonville, Florida, and the third one in Phoenix, Arizona. So really covering the whole continent with, the, with organ repair centers. And if you think about it, it's really taking organ transplantation the same way that blood transfusion went. You know, we transfused the first person to save a life was a bleeding soldier in a battlefield, and we took the blood straight out of the healthy soldier and put it into the bleeding soldier. And that saved a life or two and probably killed a few people. Then we learned how to do it safely with organ banks and individual hospitals as a cottage industry. And then we went better to scale it, saying we got to collect it in a standardized way in standardized collection centers, process it, separate the components to improve the efficiency so that platelets go to the person who needs platelets, red cells go to the person who needs red cells, and, and uh, you know, plasma goes to the pe people who need plasma, and you don't waste a scarce resource, and you 
track it, you collect it properly, you distribute it properly, and, and, and quality control it. I think that's where transplantation is going to go. So the, the second thing is how we currently, and the final point, is we currently do this by um, treating each organ like a patient and managing it uh, on a step-by-step -step basis, and, and it takes a lot of expertise, and we're trying to look at automating it. And so this device here is really saying, if we're going to fix an organ, how are we going to interrogate it? Can we automate it so that the, the system will go through all of its steps to look after a lung, and instead of doing one at a time, I envision doing 10 or 20 lungs at a time, 10 or 20 kidneys, and we can really scale the ability to repa replace organs uh, to save lives. So uh, in, in a very short period of time, the, the culmination of what we understood about organ injury and what we've learned in the, in the bioengineering capabilities that we have together, we're really transforming how transplantation will be carried out worldwide. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> The first time I ever saw a lung close up was at a conference where Mehmet Oz, the famous television yes. doctor, was speaking and he brought a diseased lung with him from a human right. and simply laid it out at the table and it was one of the most shocking things I had ever seen. It was black, it was kind of desiccated yeah. and very limp. This is uh, pink and yeah. alive. And yeah, how so closely does it approximate yeah, yeah. a human lung? So this is very much like a human lung. Uh, it, it's a, a pig lung. This lung is about two-thirds the size of your or my lung. And uh, it would probably look like your or my lung looked when we were 10 years old. So breathing city air, you w would get a little bit of, of dust particles, so you get a little bit of the dust coloring, uh, black um, soot. Uh, well, but this, this guy never smoked. This guy uh, never smoked. Yeah. He had a good country life, probably vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> so. And, and uh, the, the, the other part of it is, is uh, smokers' lungs do get significantly damaged. Not that you can't use them to save a life still, uh, but uh, to a point. There, there's one part of it is the issue of, of the contamination of particles, and then the other part of it is cigarettes actually destroy the structure of the lung. So, so the other part of our, our, our research is really, if we get a lung that's totally damaged, then just, can we just strip all the cells out of it and use the scaffold to, to build a, a, a new lung? Uh, and, you know, that's the work Dr. Tom Waddell is doing in our team, to build new lungs. Harking back to our previous discussions about spare parts, though, do we see a day when we can harvest lungs from pigs? I understand they're our closest animal yes. relative, yeah. and actually implant that into humans? Yeah, they're, they're not our closest animal genetically, but, but certainly in terms of suitability for organs for transplantation, size, anatomy, and so on, works. And, and there are a number of people um, working on that and, and getting pretty close. So actually taking um, you know, embryos and putting human genes into the pig and therefore uh, breeding pigs that are humanized and uh, we're working with them to, to look at transplanting them. The other uh, capability of ex vivo lung perfusion is if you take a pig lung that has been modified for transplant, you can then say, well, what further modification can you do to enhance the function, the longevity of the organ, and, and so on. We're also, um, the next question that often comes up is, well, can you repair my lung so I don't need a transplant? And, and we're uh, um, extending this technology to in vivo lung perfusion. So everything that we've learned about how to keep a lung alive without damaging it, saying, well, okay, can we do the same thing inside the body? And we have a clinical trial actually right now looking at treating lung cancer uh, and cancers that have spread to the lung inside the body with IVLP, in vivo lung perfusion. So again, I think the future will be can we actually support a lung and repair it in your body? Hmm. Two more questions, quick ones. Um, 
can this form of apparatus be used for other organs, for example, kidneys? Would this be an appropriate device for doing as you do, which is be able to preserve them longer, get them to the recipient in a better way, and can this work for kidneys? Right. So, you know, this concept of ex vivo perfusion was, has been around for a long time. In fact, uh, Leonardo da Vinci had drawings of ex vivo perfusion apparatuses. And really, uh, over the, the decades and, uh, and millennia, people have been trying to do it by making one machine that can take care of all organs. And I think, and, and that has never succeeded yet. So uh, what we did was succeed in saying, what does, it take, what does it take to make a perfect situation for a lung? And we've done that. And now we're doing it for liver, for kidney. So it won't, it, it'll be variations on this, but, but have technology that says, okay, this liver, which has a dual blood supply that makes bile, that has a vulnerable uh, blood supply to the bile ducts, needs a different kind of nutritive solution, needs a different kind of perfusion, different temperatures, different, and, and really optimize it for each organ. I remember a really bad 1950 sci-fi film which had a kind of device like this, but inside, bubbling away, was a brain. That's the next talk, I think. That's the next talk. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.